meu objetivo aqui é contar para vocês um pouco de como a Tecnisa olha a inovação e mostrar alguns projetos. Lá fora, errar é super valorizado. Quais são os técnicos, né? O que eu, eu, como aluno, devo me focar? Hello! My name is Greg Eaton. I'm here from Autodesk. I'm the Vice President of Marketing from Autodesk. I'm here visiting from San Francisco here in Sao Paulo today and this week. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to the first, Brazil's first online Congress of Engineering or the Congresso de Janeiro. Uh, I apologize in advance, by the way, for my Portuguese. It is not my first language. I'm going to try a few words today during my presentation, but please don't uh, hold me accountable for my bad apprentice pronunciation. Uh, so I'm going to be talking you to, to you today about something that uh, I'm very excited about and we're very excited about at Autodesk, which is the future of making things. So Autodesk, we make software for people who make things, whether it's the car that you drive, the, uh, the building that you live and work in, perhaps it's the movie or game that en entertains you. There's a better chance than not that the software used to not only design those things, but also make those things was Autodesk software. Autodesk uh, was based, uh, was formed uh, more than uh, 35 years ago, uh, and we have, since that time and today, we have one singular mission, which is to help people to imagine, design, and create a better world. We have approximately 5.6 million customers, professional customers worldwide, and many, many, many times that number of students and academic institutions that use our software every single day. So the future of making things. Autodesk has, uh, was actually born out of a, a big technology disruption, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. And today we're experiencing another one, a disruption that has many, many different facets from cloud computing to virtual reality to machine learning and generative design to mobile computing and social computing. All of these are combined are creating a really exciting time for people like yourselves who have committed their lives, committed their passions to designing and making the world around us. Perhaps one of the most interesting things that we're seeing is across all of the industries that Autodesk serves, there's a convergence. Uh, industries like manufacturing are looking to their cousins and their brothers and sisters over in the architecture, engineering, and construction uh, worlds and learning from them. Uh, the world of media and entertainment is looking to architecture and learning from them. For example, architecture companies and construction companies uh, are, are using methods that have long been deployed in manufacturing like robotics to help design and make the buildings and the infrastructure around us. Manufacturing customers like uh, companies like uh, car companies are looking to the world of media entertainment and the storytelling and the visualization that happens uh, with some of Hollywood's biggest blockbuster movies, they're using that same technology to help design, not only design their products better, make their products better, but to tell the story about how these products are, are, are going to be used. Most significantly, I would say, is we are seeing uh, that the, 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 the days of having very isolated and uh, separate disciplines around design and making, uh, those lines are blurring. And there is, this, uh, there is this relationship between the way things are designed, the way things are made, and ultimately the way that things are used that is really exciting. And this interrelationship is something that we're seeing across all of the industries uh, and customers that we serve today. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what I mean. From a design perspective, uh, we see a number of big trends. Uh, first of all, all around collaboration. The way that we collaborate to design things today is, is really changing thanks to advances in communication and social media and communities. The, uh, the days of when people would uh, only design with, with uh, other designers that are co-located with them in the same location, uh, that's a thing of the past. Designers are now working uh, across, you know, not only with other designers across the street, across town, across their country, across the world. They're collaborating together to design things. We're also seeing uh, much greater access to uh, capital and resources. New companies, young companies, sometimes individuals, are able to access the same type of uh, financial resources 
and uh, uh, infrastructure resources that large companies used to be the only ones that had access to. And they're, they're, they're leveraging uh, this financial capital and infrastructure to design and compete at the same level as the larger organizations. And finally, cloud computing is really changing the game in, within design. Um, we saw this many years ago, more than a decade ago, Autodesk saw cloud, the, that cloud computing was going to have very interesting uh, implications for the way people design for a couple of reasons. One, to be able to collaborate better and to be able to share designs, which are massive, massive data files, to be able to share those designs seamlessly with colleagues uh, around their company or around the world. We also uh, began to plan for a time when um, the cloud would, would be able to offer up seemingly unlimited computing capacity, infinite computing, so that uh, high intensive design applications, compute intensive design applications like simulation or rendering, where, uh, where professionals and students would have to uh, have access to supercomputers or, or a room full of servers, now virtually anyone can have access to that same level of capacity just by having a connection to the internet. Really exciting. Moving into the world of make, uh, I already mentioned this convergence of industries between uh, the way uh, products are designed and made and the way buildings are designed and made. Some of the things we're seeing uh, as architecture companies start to adopt uh, manufacturing methods uh, like prefabrication, and you can see an example of that here. In the world of manufacturing, microfactories is a huge trend, not only for uh, smaller designers where they can tap into fab labs and tech shops which are popping up around the world, these smaller micro fab factories are also being created within larger companies. We have many companies, including some of the world's largest automotive companies, who are creating micro factories within their, uh, within their on premises so that their designers and engineers can have access and the flexibility that micro, micro factories uh, deliver. And then one, one last trend that I'll mention is this idea of customization. Customization and the ability to really customize and personalize a product, uh, whether it's a, a, a product or a building, is, um, is really becoming table stakes for any, uh, any uh, design and maker. One example uh, pictured here uh, is a, a customer of ours in the New York, New York City area where they um, will scan uh, their customer's ear when they purchase new earbuds, and then using that 3D scan, they'll 3D print uh, a customized ear earbud just for their specific ear uh, that um, that delivers a you know a real personal and customized experience. And finally, use. So I talk, I've talked about design. I've talked about the designing of things, the making of things. Now the using of things is also having some really interesting implications. First of all, the um, the line between the digital world and the physical world, the digital design and the physical design is really is really blurring. And you can see an example of that here. Also, the peripheralization is <laughs> one of those words I can't even say it in English. The uh, the number of sensors out there that are uh, that are being embedded into all types of products from uh, everything from your smartphone to your automobile, even concrete. Some of our customers are starting to put sensors into concrete and buildings in, in ways that we've never seen before. And these sensors are providing information not only uh, to improve the overall product experience for the, for the consumers, but also giving information back to the designers, back to the engineers, so you have this seamless loop of feedback and uh, ability to continuously improve the product based on the real-time information coming from those that are using the products. And lastly, perhaps one of the biggest uh, uh, things that we are seeing evolve and change is who is designing and making things and where they are designing and making things. Um, there is a great deal of passion worldwide, whether it's in our media and entertainment industry, our, uh, our manufacturing industry or our, our architecture, engineering, and construction customers uh, when it comes to uh, tapping into all of these new methods, these new technologies within design, make, and use to uh, make the world around us. What I'd like to do now, uh, before I talk more about uh, not only what we're seeing today, but what we uh, are expecting to see as we move into the future, I'd like to take a step back and look a little bit of, at uh, our industry's history 
talk about how we got to where we are today. Uh, and I'm going to begin at that moment in time where, coincidentally, uh, Autodesk was born out of um, this, this era where uh, the design that was done traditionally on paper moved to uh, the digital world. And, I'm, and, and we call this the era of documentation. This was a moment in time when uh, the, those designs moved from the analog world to the digital world, mostly in 2D. But for the first time, we were able to uh, experience and manipulate and um, uh, really express our imagination in the digital form. It was an exciting time. And from there, we evolved to a point where we went from 2D designs eventually into 3D designs, and then to a point where we started to really optimize those designs. And we call this the era of optimization. So this was a time when we, uh, we took that step from having a static uh, 2D design to a 3D design that we could really, uh, for the first time, experience something in the digital world before it was real. As, uh, as we like to say, you know, we were able to build an entire building before we actually laid the first digital brick, uh, sorry, physical brick. We were able to build it digitally first before we laid the first physical, physical brick. I'm talking about things like rendering, uh, simulation, being able to simulate a product and, and really see how it performed in the real world. From there, we moved into the current era. And this is an era that's really been defined by some of the technologies and some of the trends that I've already talked about. Uh, cloud computing, mobile computing, uh, machine intelligence, generative design, 3D printing, and other forms of uh, additive and subtractive manufacturing. Uh, we call this the era of, of optimization. And it's been defined throughout the design and make and use phases of, uh, of what our customers do. Let's talk about design for a moment. The relationship between the physical world and the digital world has never been tighter. Uh, you can see a great example of this where one of our customers is using, uh, using mobile technology as well as drone technology to help in the building in the design of, uh, of this infrastructure. And I say, when I say that, I'm very deliberate in, in saying it in that order, where it has traditionally always been design and build Today, it is design and build and design and build because of this relationship between digital and physical. You're able to, as a customer, as a designer, as an engineer, you're able to iterate and work very closely with your partners uh, in the physical world to make the best possible thing, the best possible product, the best possible building uh, that you can. From a, in, in, the make, uh, in the world of making, uh, where we're seeing a lot of advancements. I've touched on a few from robotics to um, additive and subtractive manufacturing. 3D printing is one that has gotten a lot of, uh, a, a lot of fanfare. And I'll talk about some examples that I've used that um, in, a, in a really interesting way. Generative design. Generative design is, a, um, is, is, is almost a form of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning where for the first time, uh, computer-aided design is truly that where rather than starting with a blank uh, digital piece of paper and, and putting your design into that and trying to uh, imagine that, you start with a, you, you give the computer a set of, um, of restraints, a set of parameters that uh, around the product that you want to design. And the computer then gives you back some options. And that's how you, and you design collaboratively with the computer uh, from there. Great example of that is a, a customer of ours uh, out of France. Uh, company you may have heard of, Airbus, they are designing their next generation planes using generative design to design the um, probably one of the most critical parts of the plane, the partitions that literally hold uh, an aircraft together. They're using generative design to design it, and then they're using advanced 3D printing to create these partitions to uh, be stronger than they've ever been before, but also lighter than they've ever been before. And that's hugely important uh, when you're in the airplane business. Because every, every ounce, every bit of weight uh, translates into uh, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes billions of dollars, depending on which Airbus customer you might be. 15 minutes. The last a aspect of uh, the era of connection that I would touch on is uh, around the use phase. And these sensors and this ability to have a consistent stream of feedback that not only influences the design, but also makes the product perform better. 
Great example uh, pictured here is one of uh, Autodesk customers, GE. GE makes a lot of things, right? Um, in this case, they make their, this is their next generation locomotive where they are uh, using sensors and some really advanced um, uh, onboard uh, um, programming. They're able to, um, they're able to have a, a level of cruise control, intelligent cruise control within these locomotives that help them optimize the amount of fuel they use. Um, really, really, really well. It's a huge deal to GE's customers, much like uh, Airbus customers that I talked about before. And this last, this, 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 this other element of the uh, era of connection is around mobility. The, uh, our, our customers, our current customers, but probably more importantly, and maybe more importantly to those of you who are watching today, our next generation of customers have wildly different expectations when it comes to where and when they work where they design, where they make. And that's where mobile computing really comes in. It allows, it allows designers to uh, be unlocked from their massive workstation in their, in their office or, uh, or school and able to take those designs virtually anywhere. Uh, and that uh, has had huge implications for not only the flexibility that designers want uh, as they design and make things, but also it allows them to bring those designs, bring that process into the field where the products are being used, whether it's onto a construction site or it's into a manufacturing uh, facility, or it's even just to a presentation where you're sharing your next great design with a client. I'm gonna talk about a few examples of some really exciting customers uh, that uh, are using and deploying some of these techniques. The first is Lightning Motors which is a, uh, a small six-person company uh, in southern, uh, sorry, northern California uh, that is using generative design and advanced 3D printing to make the, the next great electric motorbike. Uh, pictured here, this bike uh, was able to um, recently beat uh, the world's fastest uh, uh, gasoline-powered motorbikes in, in a race. In fact, it was a, the Pike, Pike's Peak race. They beat the competition by more than 20 seconds, which is a huge margin, and uh, a huge margin for an electric bike. Really exciting. And what's interesting here, this they were competing against large, really large, sophisticated manufacturers, um, uh, motorcycle uh, and automobile manufacturers in these races. This was just a six person, uh, six people that had an idea, they had a dream, they got together and they made it real. The next one is uh, really close to my heart, and it's also uh, very close to uh, to here to, to all of us here in Sao Paulo. Uh, this was a, actually a company I met just this uh, week, and by company I mean it's two people, two students actually, an engineering, a local engineering university student, and a local uh, design student, and the two of them uh, had an idea. They had this uh, really a problem that they wanted to address. They saw that. Um, that children, visually impaired children, were at a real disadvantage when it came to communicating with children who had no, dis no visual disability. And by communicating, I mean the way that all children communicate, which is through play, right? All of us were kids once, and we all know that is the way you communicate with other children. They wanted to come up with a way to, uh, a toy that would allow visually uh, impaired uh, children to be able to play and engage with children who had no issues with their visibility in a really seamless and comfortable way. And so um, they came up with a concept, you can see it pictured here, it's called Togo Toy. Togo is Japanese for integration. And Togo Toy is, um, is a product that was uh, designed using um, Fusion 360, Autodesk Fusion 360, which is, was really the first cloud-based product design and manufacturing tool, and today is by far the market leader in that space. Uh, they were able to use Fusion 360 to uh, develop uh, not one, not two, but they're now on their sixth prototype. As they iterate and get ready to actually take that next step and go into production with this, with this toy, it's been really exciting, and it's been exciting to, um, to be part of that story and get to know them this week while I'm here in Brazil. Speaking of students, and I know many of you watching here today are students, you probably know, but if you don't, I'm going to tell you anyway, uh, how important um, Autodesk, put, the, the, the level of importance that Autodesk puts in our next generation, of uh, the world's next generation of designers and makers, designers and construction uh, uh, developers. 
and uh, designers and artists. And we, um, we're so committed to, to that next generation that it, just a few years ago, we made uh, the strategic decision as a company uh, to make all of our portfolio, our entire software portfolio, available to students, to teachers, to any uh, academic institution, schools, universities, etc., for absolutely free. We did that because we wanted every student, every future designer, every future engineer to have access to the same great set of tools that uh, professionals do uh, as they learn uh, their craft. And this was, you know, you can see one of the, one of the uh, results of that in the story I just told with Togo Toy. Autodesk, another way that Autodesk has been um, trying to uh, help the world um, not only get access to these new ways of designing and manufacturing that I've been talking about today, um, but also uh, bring these new, new methods to bear on making the world a better place is some, through something that we call the Autodesk Foundation. And the Autodesk Foundation is uh, an organization that we founded a few years ago that uh, goes and supports organizations that are trying to make the world better uh, and trying to make an impact on the world through, um, through donating uh, resources, including financial resources, but more importantly, our own expertise, our own network, and of course, our own software and tools. Uh, one example, uh, interesting example, actually the first Autodesk Foundation member in Brazil uh, was out of the Federal University of Uberlandia. I told you I was going to try some Portuguese today. Um, they, uh, they also, like, uh, like um, the, the previous uh, customer that I mentioned, they saw a challenge uh, that needed to be addressed and that could be addressed through design. Here in Brazil, about half a million people, about 500,000 people, have some type of prosthetic. And um, uh, one of the things, prosthetics have come very far in the last number of years, but one of the things that has not at, at improved at the same rate is the cost. Typically, they cost um, uh, around 300,000 real uh, here in Brazil. That's the average cost of a prosthetic. Through the work that was done with the foundation, the, these university students were able to bring that price down to only 5,000. Real. And why that's important is that it, in low-income areas of, of Brazil, where, uh, they did, where people do not have access to the same financial resources or necessarily the same uh, level of health care, they were able to create a, a prosthetic that was uh, available to them and allow all people who needed one to have one. I want to thank you for spending some time with me and with Autodesk today to talk about the future of making things. As you can hopefully tell, we are very passionate about uh, where the world is headed, particularly where how the world is designed and made. And we, we believe it is changing and changing for the better. There are a lot of uh, technologies and uh, uh, trends that are driving this change, and uh, it's something that you know I get excited about. Is is the um, what Autodesk has been doing over the past decade to really prepare for these changes and be at the front and actually lead this new future of making things. So thank you, thanks for being with me today, and I hope to see you soon. O meu objetivo aqui é contar para vocês um pouco de como a Tecnisa olha a inovação e mostrar alguns projetos que estão aqui. Errar é super valorizado. Quais são os técnicos, né? O que eu, como aluno, devo focar 